Hello, in this video we're going to talk about another graph problem, which is the problem of finding a minimum spanning tree for a graph. Now a minimum spanning tree is a spanning tree, and so first we'll say what a spanning tree is. A spanning tree is a tree that you can like overlay on top of a graph such that it touches every single node in the graph, and it's a tree so it doesn't have any like cycles or anything like that. And the minimum spanning tree is the spanning tree where if you add all the edges that comprise the tree up, it'll have the least total value. So this is basically like finding some kind of way to connect up all of the nodes in the graph, picking a subset of the edges such that they're all connected and it has the least total cost. If that didn't make a whole lot of sense, we'll look at it on the whiteboard and, and, and it will make sense, I think. Um, so this problem has applications in Things like if you wanted to connect up a whole bunch of cities with uh, electrical cable or water lines or internet, you know, fiber optic, what is the most efficient way to do it? Things like that. And of course it has other applications and things, you know, uh, apart from that as well. So there's a couple of different algorithms for solving this problem. The one we'll look at is called Prim's algorithm, which is a very efficient and pretty easy to understand algorithm. So let's go ahead and dive into that. All right, so here's our graph from last time of some cities in Virginia with some sort of guesstimates on how far apart they are from each other on different roads. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk first about spanning trees, and then we'll talk about Prim's algorithm to find the minimum spanning tree. So first of all, a spanning tree is a tree that touches all of the nodes in the graph. That means it's spanning. It spans the entire graph. It touches every node, and it connects them all up together. So one spanning tree could be like maybe Harrisonburg to Blacksburg, Harrisonburg to Alexandria, Harrisonburg to Charlottesville, Charlottesville to Lynchburg, Lynchburg to Roanoke, and Lynchburg to Danville, Alexandria to Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg to Richmond, and then Richmond to this one, and then this one down here. So these orange edges that I've colored in on the graph form a spanning tree. It's spanning meaning that it touches every node. If you look at it, every node is connected up to one, of, one or more of these orange edges. And it's a tree in the sense that there's no cycles or loops anywhere in the graph, but there's no like root. It doesn't really matter which one we think of as the root. You can imagine that like if we pull up this Richmond node up and the other ones sort of dangle down, it could be the root, or we could pull up Harrisonburg as the root. It doesn't really matter. There's no like concept of the root for this kind of tree. So basically we're just concerned about picking some subset of the edges that connect up all the things together. So this spanning tree has a cost, which would be the cost of all of the edges that are part of it added together. So we'd have like the 140 here plus the 135 and the 50 and the 50, the 60, the 70. All of the edges that I colored in would have to be added together to give us some value. And so the question then is what is the minimum spanning tree that we could create? I'm sure this isn't it. I just sort of picked these ones kind of randomly and I bet we can get a spanning tree that uses less total weight of the edges. And so that's the goal of Prim's algorithm. So with Prim's algorithm, what we do is we pick one of the cities to be the starting city or one of the nodes to be the starting node. It doesn't at all matter which one it is. I'll pick Alexandria here because it's up at the top. And we add that to the spanning tree. Then we're going to keep looping until we can't add any more nodes. So we only have one node in our spanning tree now. We have to add 10 more. So we're going to keep looping while there's some things that aren't part of the tree yet. And at each iteration, what we're going to do is we're going to find the edge that connects up a new city to the tree to one that already exists with the least cost. So right now we have two edges. We have the 50 and we have the 135. And of course the 50 is the less cost, so we're going to add this edge and Fredericksburg to the tree. Now we're going to loop again and we have two edges to choose between the 135 which gets us Harrisonburg or the 60 which gets us Richmond. And because the 60 is less, we'll choose that. We'll connect Richmond up to our tree with this edge right here. Now we have a couple options. We have the 135 still to get Harrisonburg. We have the 70 for Charlottesville, the 110, the 145, and the 70. We'll choose one of the two 70s. It doesn't really matter which one first. Let's say we choose Charlottesville first. So we're going to connect this one up to the graph using this edge right here. And now the next time we do this, we're going to see that this 50 gets us Harrisonburg. So we're going to connect up this node with this edge right here. Now we have a couple 70s left, um, getting us Newport News or Lynchburg. 
let's say we choose the one this time that gets us Newport News. So we're going to add this edge to the graph and Newport News as well to the minimum spanning tree we're building. Now the edge with the least cost that gets us a new city is this 35 right here to Virginia Beach. So we're going to add that into the graph as well. Now if we see we have a 210, a 145, a 110, a 140, and a 70. So we'll go ahead and take the 70, which gets us Lynchburg, Virginia right here. And now it looks like the next smallest edge is this 65 to Roanoke. So we'll add that one in. Then the 40, which adds us Blacksburg down here like that. And then we only have one left, which is this 70 here to get us Danville. And so this is the minimum spanning tree. If you notice, it's different than the one we came up with first. And if we just kind of eyeball it, I believe it does look to be smaller. And Prim's algorithm, of course, guarantees that it gives us the minimum tree. So Prim's algorithm is said to be what's called a greedy algorithm. And that's because it sort of just takes like the best thing that's available right now without looking ahead or really planning. Some problems can be solved with greedy algorithms and some just can't. We're lucky that minimum spanning tree can be solved by this greedy algorithm. We didn't really have to think ahead when we did this. We didn't have to say things like, oh, well, we want this edge over here later, so we're gonna choose this one now or any kind of like planning or backtracking or anything like that. Instead, we just said at each moment, okay, what's the shortest edge I can add? And we went ahead and took it. And it turns out that using this method does give you the minimum spanning tree. The traveling salesman problem, which we'll look at in the next video, doesn't work with greedy algorithms. You do have to think ahead in order to solve that problem. But for this one, we don't. So that's the logic behind Prim's algorithm. You build your graph sort of node by node. And each time you add a new node, you take the smallest edge that connects up a new node for you. There are a couple of different ways to implement Prim's algorithm, but the best one is to use a heap, just like it was with Dijkstra's algorithm. So let's go through this again, but this time with the more detailed algorithm, which is over here on the right, and also keeping track of our heap. The point of the heap now is to keep track of all of the edges, because one way to implement Prim's algorithm is just to every time you need to add a new node to the spanning tree, just roll through all of the edges and find the smallest one. But because there could be like n squared edges in a graph, that's not going to be a very efficient way of doing it. So instead, what we're going to do is as we add new nodes into the spanning tree, we're going to add the edges that are adjacent to it into the min heap. And then each time through, we'll get the smallest one back out again. So this sort of more detailed pseudocode over here on the right says we create an empty graph for the MST, the minimum spanning tree, and we create an empty min heap for the edges. We're going to keep track of which nodes are in the minimum spanning tree, and we're going to set them all to false because nothing's in the tree yet. I'll keep up track of that just the way I did last time by sort of circling the nodes that we have added to the tree already. Then we choose a node to add to the spanning tree first. I chose Alexandria last time just to change it up. Let's choose uh, maybe Danville first and build it from the other way around this time. And so we'll add that node to the minimum spanning tree. Then we add all of this node's outgoing edges to the heap. So I'll mark this with Danville to Lynchburg for 70. That's one of the edges. We also have Danville to Richmond for 145. And we have Danville to Virginia Beach for 210. Then while the minimum spanning tree isn't done, which it of course isn't yet, we dequeue the next edge from the heap. So now instead of having to like search through all of the edges, we are keeping track of which ones are actually viable to add. And we in log n time can find the smallest one of them. So that's going to pull out the Danville to Lynchburg edge. So that one is going to be dequeued from our heap. Then we check if the destination of that edge is already in the heap. That's possible. We'll see if it happens here. Um, but in this case, it doesn't. Lynchburg isn't in the spanning tree already. So oops, this is a typo. This should say tree right here. I'll uh, fix that on the notes page. So if the destination is already in the tree, then discard it. But of course, it isn't yet. So then we put the edge and its destination into the minimum spanning tree. So this will then be added next. Then what we do is we go through each edge of the node that we just added. So the one to Roanoke and Charlottesville and Lynchburg. And if the other side isn't in the spanning tree yet, so if Roanoke, Charlottesville and Richmond aren't in the spanning tree, add that edge to the heap. 
Okay, there we go. So I've added those and cleaned it up a little bit because we're gonna have a lot of edges in here. Then we go back to the top of the loop. The MSD still isn't done, so we DQ the next edge from the heap. The next smallest one that we get is this one right here, which is Lynchburg to Roanoke for 65. So let's take that out. Then we add that edge and destination into our spanning tree and then add all of the edges coming out of that onto the heap. So right now that's just one connecting to a new city, which is Roanoke to Blacksburg for 40. Then we go back to the top of the loop again and we'll DQ the next thing out, which as it happens is the thing we just added, the Roanoke to Blacksburg. So let's go ahead and add that onto our minimum spanning tree. Then we add the edge coming out of here. So this is the Blacksburg to Harrison edge for 140. Then we go back to the top of the loop again and pick the smallest edge, which is this one, Lynchburg to Charlottesville for 70. So we take that out and then we add that edge into our spanning tree. Then we'll add the edges coming off of that one. So I'll continue it over here. That's Charlottesville to Harrisonburg for 50 and it's Charlottesville to Richmond for 70. Then we go back to the top and DQ the next thing, which as it happens is the Charlottesville to Harrisonburg right here. So we'll add this one in and connect it up. Then we add Harrisonburg's edges. And notice that of course we won't add the one back to Charlottesville because we check if the other side of this edge isn't in the minimum spanning tree. And Charlottesville already is, and also Blacksburg already is. So the only of these three edges that we're going to add into this heap is Harrisonburg to Alexandria for 135. Then when we DQ the next thing out of this, we're going to get this edge right here, the one connecting Charlottesville to Richmond for 70. So we'll add that into our spanning tree. And then we'll add up the new neighbors of this. Lynchburg and Charlottesville and Danville are already here, but we get two new ones. We get Richmond to Fredericksburg for 60, and we get Richmond to Newport News for 70. Okay, so after adding those two edges, we go back to the top of the loop again and get the smallest thing out, which is this Richmond to Fredericksburg. So we add that edge and its destination into the spanning tree. Then we're going to add Fredericksburg to Alexandria for 50. And notice that the other option we already had discovered for, for Alexandria was this 135 for Harrisonburg, but now that one's not gonna be picked because this is in the heap now. So the next thing we take out of the heap is in fact that edge that we just added, which will cause us to connect up Alexandria along this edge right here. And Alexandria doesn't have any edges that can be added into the heap because Harrisonburg and Fredericksburg, its two neighbors are already connected. Now, when we look back through these, the next thing we're going to find is the 70, which causes us to connect up Newport News into this graph. Then we'll add the one unconnected neighbor of Newport News, which is Virginia Beach. So that's NN to VB for 35. We'll go back to the top of the loop and then we'll take that one out, getting this out of the heap and connecting this up into our minimum spanning tree. Then when we go back to the top of this loop, we'll see that the minimum spanning tree is in fact done and then we'll return the now finished minimum spanning tree back to whoever called us. And notice that there's some junk left in the heap, the old edges that we discovered but never actually had to use and that's perfectly okay. The heap doesn't and in fact almost certainly won't be empty when this process is finished. So I'm pretty sure this is the exact same minimum spanning tree we found as last time. It's possible that there's two minimum spanning trees, like uh, if different edges just happen to give you the same, the same total distance. But in this case, I think this is the same tree. So now let's look at some code to do this algorithm. Okay, this uh, program is a long one, so we won't go through it in super a lot of detail, but I've imported these linked lists packages at the top because I made the graph that we're using based on an incidence list. And we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. Then we have this class for representing an edge. And then we have this graph, which as I said, is based on an incidence list. So we have this link list of edges for every node. So each node keeps track of what other nodes it links to. Then again, like I said, we won't go into this in a lot of detail. It's basically the same sort of thing as we saw before. Now we also have a min heap of edges. In the last video on Dijkstra's algorithm, we had a min heap of nodes because Dijkstra's algorithm sort of explored the graph node by node and it got the smallest node back out from the heap as it went, the, the one with the, the least tentative cost so far. But this one actually stores edges. 
down here, this is what I had inside of this heap. I had the different edges that we were looking at and considering adding to the tree. So this is a heap of edge objects, and it's doing all the min heap things that we talked about last week. It's pretty much exactly the same. And now we have the main sort of interesting part of this, this method called find MST for minimum spanning tree. It implements exactly the pseudocode algorithm that we looked at on the, on the board together. We go ahead and make a new graph for storing the MST. So we have the original graph coming in, which is called graph in this parameter list. And then we have a new graph being made which like this one in purple here is a subset of the original graph. And then we create our min heap of nodes. Now it's possible that we have more edges in the heap than we have nodes, right? Because if we have like a 10 node graph and everything's connecting up to everything else, then it's possible we'll have up to a hundred edges. And so I made the min heap have up to n times n different nodes in it. That's the maximum that we could ever expect to have. Then in order to keep track of which nodes were in the minimum spanning tree and which weren't, I made this Boolean array called in MST. And to begin with, everything in there is false. None of the nodes are in the spanning tree to begin with. Then we chose node zero to be the first one. Over here, I chose, I think it was Alexandria to be the first one the first time we rolled through this. And then we did Danville as the second one. It does not make any difference to the minimum spanning tree that we end up getting. And so you can do any node, but node zero is the easiest because no matter how big your graph is, there's always a node zero if there's at least one node. So then we went ahead and insert it into the graph and set it to be in MSD as true. Then what we do is we went through and we looped through all of the edges of node zero in the, and added the edges coming out of it into the heap. And if you notice, this is why it's important here that we did this based on an incidence list because in an incidence list, you can loop through only the edges that actually exist for a given node. So coming back to this example here, if I chose Alexandria as my starting city, I could just loop through the edge to Harrisonburg and then the edge to Fredericksburg and add those to the heap. But if this thing was based on the adjacency matrix, I would have to basically loop through the whole row for Alexandria and look at all of the potential edges, even though almost all of them are zeros. You know, it might look like this, 0, 0, 135. And we would have to go through, is there an edge to Harrisonburg? Yes, add it. Is there one to Fredericksburg? Yes, add it. Is there one to Richmond? No. Newport News? No. Virginia Beach? No. Danville? No. And so in this case, because we have to loop through all the edges, doing the incidence list is more efficient. And we'll come back and talk about that again when we do the analysis for this algorithm. Then we have this main loop here. It says, keep going while the size of our MST is less than N, which is the size of our original graph. And what we do at each iteration is we take out the next edge by dequeuing it from our heap. Then we find what the destination of that edge is. If that node is already in the MST, then we do continue. We just move on to the next iteration of the loop. You may not see continue very often uh, in Java code, but what continue means is you go back to the top of the loop and start executing it again, which in this case will just cause us to get a new edge out of the heap. Otherwise, we'll continue on and we'll put the destination into the minimum spanning tree and marked it as being true that it's in the spanning tree and we increment the size. That's how we keep track of how many nodes we have so that we can go ahead and quit out of this when we're done. Then we also add the edge into the tree as well. So whatever edge we got out of the heap is added to the graph. We also print it out just so we can see what edges are being added. And then we do the part where we go through all the neighbors. And again, this relies on this being an incidence list. So we only loop through the neighbors that are actually here. And we see if the destination of these edges from this node, if it's not in the tree, then we insert that edge into the heap. Then when we're done that while loop here, we have the full minimum spanning tree and we can go ahead and return it. Like last time, I built the graph that we've been using as sort of our running example, and then we call the find MST method on it. So if we run this program, we'll get this printed out. And I believe this is the same one that we did when we handworked this algorithm. I'm not gonna go through and verify that. If you really want to, you can pause and do it, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. All right, now it's time to do the analysis on this algorithm. We'll kind of go through this sort of step by step here and see what's happening. So the first thing here is we create an empty graph. That's going to be big O of one. We create the empty min heap. That's big O of one. Keep track of all the nodes in the minimum spanning tree and set them all to false. The way we did that is we made a 
array of size n, or v actually, where v is our number of nodes in this graph, and we set them all to false, so that's going to be big O of v. Adding one of the nodes to the minimum spanning tree is big O of 1, and adding all of this node's outgoing edges to the heap, that's going to be interesting because remember we have v nodes and we have e edges, but we have e edges in the entire graph. So if we look at all of the edges coming out of a particular node, that's not big O of v, because although it would be if, you were, if we were using the adjacency matrix, because we only have to go through the edges that are actually there. But it's also not big O of E, because that would mean going through all of the edges in the entire graph, which we're also not doing. We're only doing it for one node. So what we're going to use for this instead is we're going to use the average number of edges for any particular node in this graph. And so that's actually going to be big O of E over V, because if there's E edges total, and v nodes total, then on average, each node has e over v edges. And so if we look at this quick little graph I drew, well, how many nodes are there? There's four nodes, of course. How many edges are there? This is tricky. It looks like there might be one, two, three, four, five, six. But in actual fact, the way this is implemented is every time we have an edge between two things, we actually have both directions. And so there's an edge between node A and B, and there's also an edge between B and A because they go both directions. So the number of edges here is actually 12. And so this E over V figure in this case is three, which is accurate because each node has three edges leaving it. It doesn't really matter too, too much in this particular step of step five right here, but that's gonna be important down inside of the body of this loop as well. So hopefully that makes sense. Then we have another thing to think about, which is how many iterations does this while loop do here? Well. Each time through the loop, we add a new node into the minimum spanning tree, and we stop the loop when the spanning tree is done. And so this is going to be about v iterations here. And so then we have 6.1 right here, in which we dq an edge from the heap, and that's going to be big O of log e, because we're storing potentially the e edges inside of this heap, and dqing one is the log of that checking if the thing is already here, and if so, discarding it, it's going to be big O of 1. Then we put the edge and its destination into the minimum spanning tree. That's also going to be big O of 1, because adding a node and an edge to a graph are constant time operations. Then we have this thing here, where we loop through all of the edges of the node we just added. And like we talked about before, that's going to be big O of E over V iterations, because that's how many edges there are. Then we have the actual work of this, which is to check something and then add something to the heap. And so that's going to be log of E to add to our heap of edges. And then this one down here is big O of 1. So let's go ahead and figure this out then. Now we have a constant plus a constant plus a, a V term plus a 1 uh, constant term plus an E over V. But really, I think that we'll probably see that this loop here is going to be what dominates the running time. It'll be bigger than the E over V factor or the V factor we already have. So let's see what that looks like. We have V iterations of the while loop plus inside of here, a log E right there, plus a constant plus a constant, which we can ignore, plus this nested loop inside of here. So that's going to be plus in E over V times by a log of E. And so then we can simplify this by multiplying the V across these two terms. And so we'll get V log E for the first term. And the V here and the V here, because it's in the denominator, are going to cancel out. And so then we have E log E right here. Now we have this V log E plus E log E. And so which of these two, if any, is the more dominant term. And I hope you'll agree that the E log E is the dominant one, because there's going to be more edges than there are vertices, or at least as many. Because if you have a graph, if you don't have at least as many edges as you have vertices, like if you have some kind of thing like this, like one, two, three, four, five, we have six edges. If I have less than six edges, then we can't actually even connect up all the nodes of one, two, three, four. Um, I'd have to add at least one more edge to make this connected. And so we have uh, E being greater than or equal to V minus one, 
because otherwise the graph won't even be connected. And if it's not connected, there is no possible spanning tree anyway. It's possible that E can be way bigger than V, right? We can have lots and lots of extra nodes connecting things up all over the place, but we have to have at least V minus one nodes for this thing to even work. And so this is gonna be the dominant term and we'll say this is big O of E log E, like that. That's our final answer for the analysis here. Hopefully that makes sense. And also something I should point out is that there are different ways of implementing this. There's another way of implementing this concept where you use a different sort of heap where you store the nodes inside of the heap instead. And there's another implementation that uses a Fibonacci heap instead of the sort of more simple binary heap that we've talked about. And so you can, you can find algorithms that have different complexities, but this is the complexity of the algorithm as we sort of wrote it out and, and designed it. Hopefully that all makes sense. Prim's algorithm is a nice one because it's nice when sort of a greedy approach does work. It doesn't always, as we're going to see in the next video, but in this case it does. So let me know if you have any questions about anything today. Thanks.